Yo, the mo he's, he says you're not to put the light under a bushel. And I'm afraid the modern bushel might be a church building. That we are called to go out into the world, not come into a building. And again, when we stop being, you know, that was kind of where we started stopping being the church, when we kind of reserved everything for a building setting. But now even when that is removed from us, then we can see the impact that it's having on our, our culture. Salt and light, they were to balance each other because salt is a hidden thing. It kind of permeates and melts into whatever it flavors or preserves. It works from the inside, but then you've got the light which shines from the outside, and it works visibly. This is what Jesus said about the light. He said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good words and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we're going to talk about light. My family has kind of had a bad history with light. My grandfather, McGraw, he was the son of an Irish immigrant that came over right after our, our Civil War ended. He and his brother came over. One of them stayed up near New York. And my great-grandfather came down to Texas area, ended up in Kolioki, Kolioki, Texas. My grandfather, one of a lot of boys, he grew up in Kolioki. He didn't know a lot about the big city stuff. So he went to the big city once, went to a hotel, and stayed in a hotel room. And when it was time to go to bed, he tried to blow out the light. He didn't know what a light bulb was. You can't blow out a light bulb. And he tried, and he tried, and he tried, and he got so frustrated, he just went to bed and slept with the light on. I think he was, you know, this is a Dr. Phil side of the family, so you know what, I, I guess that kind of, kind of fits. But anyway, the world wants to blow us out. It wants the light to go out so it can comfortably sleep. So it can rest and not have the light in its face. He wants Christians to go kind of back in their buildings and not even that now. To lose all of the influence, lose all of the preservative capabilities and the ability to shine reality and truth all around us in our culture. They'd rather live in the lack of truth, in their own truth, in their own reality. Well, three things you see from this passage is um, who we are, what we should not do, and what we are called to do. We're called to be a light, a light in the world. That is our job description. We are the light. The light is not going, we're not one of many lights. We are the light. The world's not going to find a light shining on truth anywhere else. It's going to find artificial lights, lights that are going to distract, be a light show. But the actual light that clearly shines on the truth is going to come from the church. In Las Vegas, there is a hotel called Luxure Hotel, and it is a, with an Egyptian theme. And the Egyptians, they believe that the path to eternal life was on a beam of light, so light's a big thing with this hotel. They, they believe the light would go, come off the side of a pyramid, and that's how you'd, you'd make your way to eternity. But they have there what they claim is the brightest man-made light anywhere in the world, and it has the strength of 40 searchlights. This one light, or 40 billion candles. That's like if you took everybody on earth and gave them six candles, the light it would produce. On a clear, light, clear night, that light is visible to an airplane flying over Southern California, even though they are in Las Vegas. So the brightness of this light is unbelievable. What would happen if all Christians started to be the light they were called to be? How bright would that light be? You couldn't ignore it no matter how far you tried to get away from it. You need to realize when Jesus calls us to be something, that is like a target saying, sick him to a dog to Satan. He will try to make sure that we are not light. He will try to make sure that we are not salt. 
He will try to make sure, as Jesus prayed, that we would be one, that we would be unified, as he and the Father are one, that we would not be unified. So whatever he prays for us to be, you can be assured that that's what Satan will attack in the body of Christ. It says, uh, you know, who we are, light of the world. Describes it even more as a city set on a hill, and that city cannot be hidden. We shouldn't be able to be hidden. You know, there was a restaurant that was really struggling, and it had it came up with a marketing scheme that said, come and see the invisible fish. It just put a, a uh, aquarium out there with nothing in it, and people would just get there, and they'd be looking and looking, and it was a, an attraction. Come and see the invisible Christians. Come and see us. Come and see the ones that you know are not visible as the body of Christ is supposed to be. Just come and look at an empty place where we should be in culture and, and in society and schools and businesses, the invisible Christians. Light travels at 186,281 miles per, that's just amazing, second. Light's an amazing thing. In the dictionary, it, the basic definition says it's something that makes vision possible. And we are as light to make vision possible for the world to see what it needs to see. And our light is to point, to make visible God, Jesus Christ, so the world can see it. Because without that truth, you see, the world struggles. I have a whole list of light-related injuries. I have stubbed toes, I have bumped my head, I have banged my shin because there was not enough light. And the older I get, I can't read a menu unless somebody turn off the light. We need light. You know, the light went out in Diana, I think twice in the last week or so because of some storms that came through. So we weren't ready, and so you're trying to make your way around when everything just went dark. But you walk in the kitchen, and you are reaching around, and you knock a glass off, and it hits the ground. What's the first thing you do? Nothing. You stand still. Don't move. I need a light to be safe because there are dangers all around. I mean, we aren't the light, then the world is in danger to be harmed, to be cut, to be... be uh, we can see all the things in our culture now that are not exposed for what they are because we stop being the light. So without light, our world makes one mistake after another. And again, we are the light. It's the quest question is whether we're going to choose to shine or not. And if we don't, the world's left in darkness. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, when you speak of heaven, your face should shine like the sun. But when you speak of hell, your regular face will do. Problem is, we speak of heaven, we speak of forgiveness, grace, mercy, the cross, the blood of Jesus with our regular face. It's not supposed to do. We're supposed to shine. Shine things on the things of God so that the world can see them and understand them. How do you conquer darkness? You introduce light. And darkness flees away. One of our greatest lights is God's word. And then the spirit is another when the spirit fills our lives and begins to produce its fruit. That's light. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, the self-control. All that should be emanating, shining from our lives. But the world wants to repress those things. Psalm 119 says, the entrance of thy words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. It also says in 119, the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 1 John 1 says, in him is the fountain of light. And in him light, in his light we see light. Because God is light. Light's a big deal for us. It's a big theme that the Bible uses to describe who we are. Some things that light does, it colors the drabness. You know, our being in the world should make the world a more colorful and beautiful place. A Christian 
reflecting the light of heaven is a bright light in a dark place. It's a thing of beauty in a drab world. Light changes the day. Whenever you have the sun that moves out from behind a, a cloud, and all of a sudden the light just kind of covers the landscape, it just changes. It changes so much attitudes and perspectives. I'm afraid more Christians are like the cloud rather than the sun. We should change the day. We have the resources within us that should bring things different into circumstances that the world struggles with and that we struggle with. We possess those, those, those difference makers. We should, we should change the day in a moment and the moment of the day. You know, we should understand the difference that God makes. It takes a sick person to understand health. I think it takes an old person to understand youth. It takes a person in the light to really understand the darkness. We should not just be the light. We should understand the darkness. Because we look at it from the perspective of escaping it. Coming out of the darkness into his marvelous light. We should be celebrating that. Because we have that to offer the world of the difference that light makes to darkness. And again, we're the light of the world. We're not to be the light of the church. We're not to be just kind of a, a bright spot, a pew somewhere. I mean, we are to be light of the world and not be afraid to shine out in the world. The Jews claim to be light, but Paul in Romans 2 began to tell them, no, you're not. And Jesus certainly uh, proved that they weren't as well. They were even under the belief that they were the light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to be. But Jesus found them to be the opposite. And so here he is speaking to this hillside and saying, you guys, not those Pharisees, are the light of the world. Once you think they're the light, are not the light. But you're the light. In 2020, the church claims to be the light. A lot of Baptists, we claim to be the light. Hopefully here at Walnut Creek, we claim to be a light. But if Jesus came and was looking us in the face, what would he say about our life? Are we under a dimmer switch? Turning it down when we need to? Up when we're at church? Let's put it on full. Oh, back out in the world. Dim, 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 dim. We are not to be the religious of the world. We're to be the light of the world. We're not to walk around with our noses looking down at the, at the world, avoiding the world. That's not what being light is. Being light is putting a spotlight on, on God, on the glory of God, the things of God, on, on the Son of God, and letting the world be able to see it in its brightest, the brightest way possible. In 2 Corinthians 4, it says, God, who first ordered the light to shine in the darkness, has flooded our hearts with light. God didn't just say to the, to the world, let there be light. He said to the Christian, let there be light. We can now enlighten men only because we can give them the knowledge of the glory of God as we have seen it in the face of Jesus Christ. This is something that we have something inside of us that's not of us, that we have the responsibility to let out of us. It's flooded our hearts, it says here. And we have the responsibility to, to enlighten men, to give them the knowledge of the glory of God because we should have a relationship with Christ, that we have seen it in his face. When was the last time your, your face was in the face of God? Open your Bible. That's the best avenue to that. It says we're a city on a hill. That says two things. Number one, we're a light together. If you are living in Jesus' day or traveling in Jesus' day, you've been impressed as you've gone by hillsides and you would have seen cities which they would put on hillsides, on hills. Because on a hill, it uh, was easier to be cooled by the breezes and easily, more easily defended. So they would put 
cities in elevation. And when you were up on the hill, you would light your particular part of that city, and it would produce a city of lights. So we are lights together. That's our responsibility. We're a collection of lights that should be seen for miles and miles and, and should not be able to be hidden. We're also lights alone. It says, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Each individual house had the responsibility of allowing its light to shine and not put it under a basket. Now, these lights, they were in like clay containers. They had this flax which made a, a wick and the last thing you do is light it and put it under a bushel or a basket. Just imagine if you went to your house and you took every light, every lamp, every light bulb, you took them all and put them in one room of your house and shut the door. And the rest of the house was total darkness. But you had a lot of bright light in that one room. It's kind of like the church. We go in and we shine, 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 shine in that one little compartment area. And the world is struggling in darkness. Struggling in darkness. And when you're in darkness, bad things happen. You know, I grew up in the, in the country, smaller than Diana, in, in a place called Manfred, Oklahoma. It's about uh, 40 miles from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I lived outside of Manfred. We didn't have, we had three channels, and they went off, off at a certain time of day. But we didn't have things like computers or uh, cable TV or video games. Or, we didn't have any of that kind of stuff. We didn't even have FM radio until the middle of my childhood. So we had to figure out games. <clears throat> and one night, the game at our house was Tony was going to chase everybody else with a dead bullfrog. <laughs> Tony found a bullfrog out in the road where you expect to find a dead bullfrog. He picks it up and the game just kind of evolved. Nobody wanted to touch it but Tony. And so he thought, thought that was funny and he started chasing us. And we just ran around the house and around my house and around my house. And my dad says he still remembers looking out and watching, well, there goes somebody, there goes, well, there's Tony. What's that in his hand? Tony had a bullfrog chasing all of us around and around the house. And, you know, Tony was it the whole time. You know, nobody else took their turn of being it. Tony just kept chasing us. But my dad had a, had a ham radio that had this big, long tower, probably a third of a football field high, and it had this long wire that came down from where it attached to the house, and it kind of had a, a securing anchor wire. And Tony... One time he came around that house, and I had stopped to watch behind a bush. And Tony didn't see the wire. The bullfrog didn't see it either, because they, they both hit that wire. And he hit it about clothesline high. And down he went in the darkness, running around that house at, you know, after midnight, chasing each other with a bullfrog. And the game ended. Suddenly, that was it. Tony was out, the bullfrog wasn't moving. I mean, it was done. Darkness is dangerous. And the world's out there trying to have fun in the darkness. And they're dealing with things worse than dead bullfrogs. And then suddenly, wham! That's what happens in the darkness. That's what happens when the church ceases to be the light and darkness goes across the landscape of people who don't know any better, which we should be showing them better. Second question is what we should not do. Put it under the basket, as we've already kind of mentioned. You know, what have you done with your lamp since you lit it, since you came to faith in Christ? Where has your life gone? Where has your lamp gone as far as its intensity and, and brightness? Again, many come to church and they're very visible here, but they go out in the week and they're kind of secretive about their, their faith like a Nicodemus would be. And many people think that Christianity is only coming to church. 
and uh, doing things here. That's backwards. That's not what it's supposed to be at all. It's what happens when we leave this building which determines our light shining or not shining. When we go out from this place, we're going to walk out into a dark, dead, deceived, and doomed world. And we're going to decide whether to shine or not, to tell them that God loves them, that His Son died for them, and uh, we'll save them if they will receive that message. It's a responsibility, and a lot of the world doesn't want to see that. One young man who had become a Christian, was headed to a summer camp, and he came to his pastor, and he asked his pastor to pray for him. He said, I'm going to be going to this summer camp, and, and I don't think anybody else there is a Christian. I really need you to pray for me. So the pastor prayed for him. And after the summer was over, he returned, and the pastor asked him, he said, Son, I want, want to know. I knew you had been saved, and I knew it was going to be difficult on you, so I prayed for you while you were even working there this summer at the, labor, at the lumber camp. And, uh, and so I was praying that they wouldn't make it too hard on you. And the young man said, oh, no, uh, I didn't have it hard at all. In fact, nobody ever found out that I was a Christian. So it stayed easy. He thought that was success. That was major failure. Put ourselves under a bushel of fear. Put ourselves under a bushel of, of apathy. Now, it, it appears that we don't seem to care that the world is going to hell all around us because of an absence of light. In John 1, 9, it said that Christ is the light that lights, lightens every man that comes into the world. He's the only true light. We're the reflectors of that true light. He's, he's like the sun and we're like the moons that are to reflect that. It'd be horrible to have a moon too lazy to shine. And we all become like the dark side of the moon. And we have this treasure in this earthen vessel, this gospel of Jesus Christ, that much of the world doesn't understand or doesn't know. So many in the church have not shared their faith in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They refuse to shine. And that's what we're called to do. It says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Franklin Graham was on the Jay Leno show years ago. And when Franklin Graham came out, Jay Leno said to, some of you kids even know who Jay Leno is. Okay. The Jay Leno began the Tonight Show after Johnny Carson. Oh, you know who Johnny Carson is? No. Uh, <laughs> Jack Parr, let's see how far back we can go. But anyway, he, uh, he told Franklin Graham, Jay Leno told Franklin Graham that he was kind of nervous having him there. And Franklin Graham said, well, don't be nervous. You know, God loves you. Christ died for you. And you kind of gave him a quick gospel. And Jay Leno said, well, the reason I am kind of nervous is I know because you're here that your dad's probably watching this show tonight. I'm kind of nervous that he's watching me now. Shine in such a way that, that your good works glorify your Father who is in heaven. So let your, let, let your light shine before men. Don't restrict it. Just get out of the way. You don't, doesn't say you have to produce the light. Just let the light shine. Let God do what he wants to do in your life. You know, when, we, when I was a kid, they had these kerosene lamps. That's what people would take when they'd go camping. I mean, they stunk. And then whenever they burned a while, they kind of put a black soot inside the, uh, the glass. And if you were going to have that really shine right, you'd have to clean out that soot before you used it again. we got too much soot inside of us. That's restricting the, the ability of that light that we should be letting shine to actually shine through our lives. It's too much of a barrier that's restricting it. You know, when I was was young, this is one of those stories I don't want to tell. I remember track practice. Uh, we, uh, I went to a school at a school that had just been newly built in 
in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it's, it's only lasted five years, and the population shifted, and they closed it down. But anyway, this school didn't have a track. And during track season, we'd have to travel over to another school, and they would have their workouts, and we'd have our workouts, so we'd just stay separate from them. And their coach came over while we were stretching, getting ready to, to do track practice, and looked at our track team down there, and, and he made a comment about uh, two different shirts. One beer shirt and one FCA shirt stretching right next to each other. Guess who had on the beer shirt? And this coach from uh, Memorial High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma said, hey McGraw, I like that shirt. I mean, you're right next to you and the FCA shirt right next to each other. And my thought was, wait a minute, I'm in FCA too. I didn't realize at that time it'd be three years before I would really be born again. I was just a church, sometime go to kid, go to church kid. And it reflected in my light, not shining at all, because I didn't have a light. Three years later, the light would become a spotlight. Because it was not me trying to be religious or do what was expected, but suddenly it was God in me starting to shine. There wouldn't be any more beer shirts after that. Let your light shine. Let your light shine in such a way that they might see your good works. Remember that uh, um, song, uh, song from uh, that Australian band? What are they called? Shine. Uh, let them wonder what you got. Let them wish that they were not on the outside looking bored. Little River? Little river? No, it's the Christian one. <laughs> Newsboy, there it is. Little river bean. All right, shine. Let them wonder what you got. Let them wish that they were not on the outside looking bored. Shine. Let it shine before all men. Let them see good works and then let them glorify the Lord. Obviously, it was from this passage. On the outside looking bored. The world doesn't think they're out there looking bored. They think they come in here and get bored. We should have lights that are so shiny and glorifying God that the last thing they, they attach to us is boredom. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Just let them happen. They're already prepared. They're set in motion. We just need to allow them to happen. And notice what good works are. Good works are works that are carried out in the power of the Holy Spirit, performed for the glory of God. In fact, they are defined by those, good works are defined by Jesus here as those which cause earthly men to glorify a heavenly God. And you see that in chapter 6, there's a whole sermon here, in chapter 6 is just part of the sermon, he's warning the Pharisees to not glorify yourselves, when you go out and when you pray and when you fast and when you give, that's not glorifying God, so it's not a good work. Not the way they were doing it. But our good works should always point beyond us to God to give him the glory and not to bolster us. That is by definition what a good work is that God calls us to is all about. When we're letting him produce that good work, then it'll always bring out that result. So light does not exist to call attention to itself, but to draw attention to the things that it illuminates. So our message is not about us. It's about a great God. It's about God's son and, and God loved us so much he sent his son and that we can be saved by what Christ did for us. And that's our purpose, to make people look beyond us and to always see Jesus, always see God behind what we are doing and who we are and to point a dark and decaying world that's lacking salt and light to the answer, to the hope. And unless you're focused on God's word, you're not going to direct the glory to God. 
Because, you know, God's only going to get the glory for things that he can do and we can't. So if you are never allowing faith to take you to, the, to those places, then you're not in the zone where God's glory can be seen. You know, Gideon, when God called Gideon out of that little, little uh, wine press where he was trying to thresh wheat, called him out and he eventually you know, did the fleece and everything, called people together, 135,000 Midianites were coming upon them. All they could muster was 32,000. And then God comes to him and says, Gideon, we got a problem. It's like, Houston, we got a problem. And Gideon says, yes, we do. I've only got 32,000 against 135,000. And God said, that's right. There's too many. That's the problem. I can't get my glory. We got to whittle this thing down. And Gideon's thinking, do I send out another call? God says, don't send out a call. We got to get send some people home. So worked it down all the way to 300. And that was the point where God said, okay, now there'll be no doubt that this is all about me. All about me rescuing you. Like David before a giant, the only answer is going to be God. You know, I often have to remember that my ways are not God's ways. I got a lot of good ideas, and I bring them to God on a regular basis, and he just is not impressed. Because I'm always wanting to get God to put me in a position of advantage. And God seems to have this position of certain defeat. You know, he, he picks the person with the least capability. He seems to take the worst timing. He said, all right, I'm ready. Because there's going to be no other explanation now. Except for me. God's glory. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When we read that verse, we often think of our sin nature. You know, that we fall short. But sin also causes us to, to have stolen from us the opportunity to experience the fullness of God's glory. He caused us to fall short of a life of purpose, which God made us for. This amazing life that is always evidencing his glory. We are not a secret society. We are to be a city set on a hill. Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. He said to them, you've come to me that you might have life to this group. The other group failed to shine. Jesus pointed to a hillside that wasn't a, where he did this uh, sermon. There actually was a city that was there that they could look to. Maybe as the day was getting later, he, the shining was starting to happen. But they all understood what it meant. You know, in 1874, the uh, New York Prison Commission employed a guy named Richard Dugdale to study the state prisons. Dugdale was surprised to find criminals in several prisons who were all descended from the same family, the family of Max Juke. Born about 1720, he had been an alcoholic and a lowlife, and his name's been changed in this, so you won't know it. Uh, the study later expanded at Yale and Princeton to include about 1,200 more of his descendants. And the tally was that of his descendants, 300 convicts, 27 murderers, 190 prostitutes, 509 alcoholics and drug addicts, and so on. The estimated cost to New York had been $1.3 million to support this family in money back then, 1870s. Another researcher decided to look at another family in comparison that had lived along the same time in New York, and that was Jonathan Edwards, Presbyterian minister in the family who had become a pastor at age 17. He was a missionary to the Indians at one point, a great theologian in American history, president of Princeton University after a while. 1,300 of his descendants were traced, about the same amount. The tally was 430 ministers, 130 lawyers and judges, 99 college professors, 13 university presidents, 60 physicians, 
11 congressmen and governors, and one vice president. Let your light permeate. Let it shine. The world needs. And if the world doesn't get from us what it needs from us, the world is going to go into deeper and deeper decay. It's amazing responsibility we've been left with. Why didn't God just do it? Because he chose an avenue of us who can't do it without him. So that when we do it with him, the world will see his glory. It won't just be a story. It will be glory. That's the story the world needs. It's a story of glory. That always points to God. As he puts us in positions, and we are in that position right now as a church. The only solution to what we are seeing in this world, in our country, is God. And the position of faith we need to move toward is to allow God to take us where we are, seemingly devoid of answers and resources that can take on such an insurmountable giant of a problem, and just get faithful. Get faithful and let God begin to prove himself to the remnant, if necessary, and to prove to this world that he is still God and that he will still choose his people in 2020 to reach this world. But we got to come to people that he can use. Let's pray.